Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker, and with me as always is Jeffrey Poole and Joe Lalo. Uh, we have another guest coming for you tonight, someone who sold a lot of books, so you're definitely going <laughs> to want to help help us grill her or, or listen in on uh, listening to us grill her. And uh, her name is Annie Belay, and uh, she hails from the Pacific Northwest. Uh, she has degrees in English and also medieval studies, and is best known for her 20 sided sorceress series. <laughs> Hi, Annie. Welcome to the show. Hi. I see you're going to be a big talker there. <laughs> no. Hey, hey, I did warn you. <laughs> okay. I'm on, the, I'm on the pain meds. <laughs> All right, no problem. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got started writing and what made you decide to self publish? Um, like, how far back do you want me to go? I mean, because I'm, like, I wrote when I was a kid, too, but I didn't get serious until 2009. All right, well, you can, I, you don't have to tell us about the story you wrote in uh, first grade that hey, won, I wrote the, won the award, if you don't want to. <laughs> it was 8,200 pages. I was so proud. Um, no, so I decided to get serious about writing and actually give it a real chance in 2009, and then... I had this horrible job that I hated that was really stressful, so I quit it and decided to become a full-time writer. Was that, were you actually making money yet then, or were you oh, just... Oh, no, nope. <laughs> Hadn't sold a thing, had had barely, you know, I mean, I'd written, like, juvenilia stuff and, like, a couple of novels that will never see the light of day, and... Uh, I started writing short stories to break into science fiction because that was what I heard you had to do, right? It's like you sell the short stories to the magazines and then the magazines somehow you build a name through some magical process of selling to these magazines and then you sell a novel to a publisher and then you sell more novels to publishers later and somewhere in there, you know, money happens. So I was really naive. <laughs> Well, I do know actually know one person, one author, and we had her on the show, Beth Cato, who did that route successfully, sold a whole bunch of short stories, got an agent, and that won some awards, I think, and stuff. And uh, so it can happen. It did not happen to me, so I have to just live vicariously through others. Yeah, it it my plan when I quit my job was to write a novel a year for ten years, and then if at the end of ten years I wasn't making a living, I would go do something else. And did you know right away that you wanted to self-publish back in 2009? No, actually, well, because that was not, like, self-publishing was bad back in 2009. It was a mark of, you know, you, you can't cut it. And then towards the end of 2009, I started following uh, Jay Conrath and um, Zoe Winters. I, I was watching what they were doing on their blogs and stuff, and I was like, you know, maybe there's a way. And at that point, I was racking up projections and getting a little frustrated and and uh, so then in July of 2010 I finally was like you know what let's just put up some stuff underneath a different name because I had these like literary fiction short stories I wrote just to get into an MFA program so they weren't like doing anything for me so I put them up under another name in July of 2010 and then I realized that self-publishing was probably the way to go of the future so Okay, yeah, I guess you wouldn't have been submitting to all the magazines and stuff if you'd known right from the start that you were going to self-publish. Um, did you actually sell any copies of those early stories? or? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, not a lot in the beginning. like, But, I mean, I just stuck them up there with no help at all. And um, I think I sold, like... I don't know, 30 or 40 copies the first few months of like these three little literary short stories. But it was enough that I was like, hey, maybe this can work. You know, it's like people are finding this and are purchasing it. You know, maybe, maybe if I did this more seriously, it could work. And so then in January of 2011, I took the plunge with my science fiction pen name and put up some of my short work that I had written um, that had either not sold or had, you know, exhausted all the markets or that, because I made my first sale in December of 2009 to a magazine and then I didn't sell another thing until August 2010. But at that point, then I started selling a little bit here and there in terms of uh, 
you know, to magazines and stuff. So I was like, all right, well, maybe I can use this as a side thing. And then at that point, I was also taking workshops from uh, Dean Wesley Smith and Christine Catherine Rush. And they were getting pretty gung-ho. I Actually, I started self-publishing before they did, but by the beginning of 2011, they were getting pretty gung-ho into that. And so I was like, all right, we'll try this. All right. And when did you kind of start publishing your fantasy novels? Um, I published my first novel-like thing in March of 2011. And okay. that book has consistently underperformed to this day. <laughs> it's yeah. been through like six cover changes. It has a good cover now, finally, but like I, I there was a lot of learning curve on that book. Right. And did you start more with kind of epic fantasy type stuff or um, the first the first book I published actually is a sort of dark fantasy fairy tale romance kind of. So right. I mean you can see why it didn't sell. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a bit weird. <laughs> I know all about the cross genre, not really easily defined <laughs> stuff. Well, and I didn't write a sequel, and there is a sequel. It's actually like a duology, and there's the, everything gets explained and summed up and happily ever after in the sequel, which um, is like sitting at twenty five thousand words on my hard drive where it's been for like three years while I just haven't done it. All right. So is it kind of? I remember last summer we were both in a box set, the uh, nine by night. And that's yeah. kind of when I first noticed you. I saw your your twenty sided sorcerer series just really take off. I know you had that first one at ninety nine cents, and it was selling like mad. Um, we'll probably ask you more about the marketing, but I'd love to kind of get your take on urban fantasy and sort of, you know, you identify yourself as a what is it a nerd gamer and geek or a, a writer <laughs> yeah. author gamer geek on your website? Uh, can you tell little, us kind of how that? Of one. Yeah, how does that all tie in, and how did it help you start that series? Well, so for a twenty sided sorceress at that point. It was funny actually because um, because of that bundle is why I wrote those books. Because at that point I was I had almost given up on writing at all and was going to go get a day job because I was really sick last year and um, spent like six months in bed rest before <laughs> uh, from like January basically to June I couldn't do anything. Um, so I I was pretty much ready to give up and then we were talking about doing this bundle and getting it organized and I was like, all right, this could be my chance. And so I sat down and I made a list of everything that I really love to read about. And then I tried to write a series that completely fulfilled that list and that became the 20-sided sorceress. So it wasn't a... I mean, I love urban fantasy. It's probably my... It might be my top fantasy subgenre that I read. It's it's probably close in there with epic fantasy, but um, you know, and so it was like kind of a natural fit, I think. And then I just wanted to to I was just so sick and so tired and so frustrated by everything that I just wanted to write something that was really fun and that would be exciting to write. And so that's why I was like, all right, I'm just gonna go full nerd on this, you know, and just just have fun. And if it doesn't sell, oh well, you know, I'll be right where I am anyway. So who cares? Let's just go for it. Awesome. Well, I think it, it's really encouraging probably to the listeners to uh, to hear that not everybody hits it out of the blocks or gates or whatever, some sports analogy thing <laughs> with uh, their first book or even their first few books. So, I, you know, for those who don't know, you've I've just seen you selling tons and tons of those books. I don't know. Your sales ranking was under like two or 300 in Amazon forever. So, Yeah, they hung out like... The top, the first three books all hung out in the top 500 for like months. It was awesome, but that day is over, alas. <laughs> well, they still seem to be selling pretty well almost a year later. So yeah, I, I do okay. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm finishing up book six in 11 months, so it's been a lot of work, but. All right. Well, that's the cool thing about self-publishing is if if you do have something that hits, you can actually be really quick to react and. You know, get more books out in the series. Yeah. Well, that was the thing is that that was the biggest mistake I made before, besides publishing a lot of short fiction and not focusing on novels and series, was that I would write these first books and then I never followed them up. And so, and actually, in, so in like November of 2011, I, I had written this thriller and it had gotten 
like you know nice rejections from publishers, but had never gone anywhere. So I threw it up under a pen name. People were trying this price matching free thing, and that was back in the Halcyon days when like you could price match something free, and then when it came back, it would have the same ranking. And so you could just shoot a book way up the charts. So I gave away like 20,000 copies of that book in a couple of days free. And then when it came back, it was selling like 50 copies a day at $5.99. And I didn't write a second book. I still have it. That pen name has one book. Yeah, well, sometimes it helps if you're something you're really excited, excited about too. And it sounds like the gamer aspect was really up your alley for sure. Well, and it was also just partially came down to do or die. It's like, well, either I make money and I'm able to start paying my medical bills or I have to get a day job. And I really didn't want a day job. Yeah, I hear they're a pain. But <laughs> before um, I hand you over to the guys, I was kind of curious looking at, to see that you'd done quite a few of your books as audiobooks. I was wondering, did you use ACX or how did you get those done? Yeah, the, I used ACX. Did you uh, do the royalty split with someone, or did you have to pay up front? Um, for some of them, let's see, I've got like, what, 14 audiobooks, 15, something like that at this point. For the first ones, I did royalty share. And then now, so like the 20-sided ones, though, are pay per, per hour. Um, and a couple of the later ones are paid per hour. Because unless, in my experience anyway, unless you're book is selling a whole lot, the audio is not going to sell that much. And I felt really bad for somebody putting in, because you know, I think it takes like about four hours of work to produce one finished hour. And so it was like, you know, if, if someone is doing a novel that is like nine hours long and, you know, they've just put in four times that amount of work and it sells 40 copies ever, you know, we're not we're not splitting very much money, and so I felt kind of bad about that. And so I've, I stopped doing the, you know, oh, just get everything into audio via royalty share, and, you know, it's, it's free money. And, like, sure, it's free money for me, but it's not really free money for the person doing all the work on the back end. So from this point on, I've decided that I'm only going to do books that sell really well be, and books and, and put the money up front so that I know, you know, I'm earning it back, but I don't know. It probably doesn't make sense, but... <laughs> No, I was just curious because you've done so many of them that I was wondering if they actually sold enough for you to make your money back and, and for it to be worth the time investment. Because I, I know a lot of people try it and only end up doing a couple books. So. Well, some of them were definitely worth the time investment. And like the 20-sided books, I mean, I've sold the audio for the first book in that has sold over a 1,000 copies. And I make about two bucks a copy generally. So, I mean, it's paid for production for multiple of the series. But, you know, most of my audiobooks have sold less than, like, 100 copies each. <laughs> There's only a couple of exceptions, and they're first books in series, or 20-sided, which is pretty much a unicorn on its own. So, <laughs> All right. Well, is that something you, would you recommend to other authors to go ahead and do it just to, so that they're available out there, or do you think it's... I think oh, if your book is selling really well, it doesn't hurt. But also, if your book is selling really well, you might want to try approaching Audible and seeing if they can do it for you and give you a deal. Because they are way better at marketing their audiobooks than... Like, I don't know any way to market audiobooks, really. And I know people who, like, were doing this for a living and were like, yeah, I don't really know how to market audiobooks either. So... So I would say if you have a really well-selling series, yeah, it would totally be worth it. You know, pay pay 100 or 200 per finished hour. You'll probably make it back within a month or two, easy. But if you don't have books that are selling at least 100 plus copies a day, you know, maybe it wouldn't be worth it. All right, cool. Thanks for satisfying our curiosity there. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and hand you to the guys to ask a few questions. Okay. All right. Um, I only have a little bit for this section, but uh, you were speaking earlier about your uh, your short stories. Uh, I have had a great amount of difficulty writing short fiction of any kind, and a lot of the people we've had on the show have expressed similar difficulties writing short fiction. Do you have any like special techniques or advice on how someone would write a satisfying plot within just a few thousand words? 
Um, read Damon Knight's writing short fiction book? I don't know. I think that it's, it's weird to me because I have a lot of problem writing long. Like, I don't like to write long. 40,000 words is my comfort zone. Um, but for, for writing short stories, basically you want to focus on, like, one character, one moment in time, you know, the, the most important event ever, basically, for that character. Like, like just pick one thing. And that way, usually you can keep it under like 6,000 words. But it's still satisfying because you can bring a character all the way from their starting point to whatever kind of completion you need. You know, they make it through the event. Things are going to work out or things are not going to work out, that kind of thing. And so just keeping it super focused. And another thing with short fiction and why I think it's a good craft learning process is you really have to learn how to make every sentence do multiple things. Because when you're writing a novel, you can kind of get away with, you know, having a paragraph or here that is just setting or just showing something about the character or just moving the plot forward. You know, it doesn't have to do multiple things. Like, in a short story, it's really important for every sentence to be doing at least, like, two out of the three main things, you know, plot, character, or, you know, world building. And so when I'm reading short stories that kind of drag or... or feel too thin to me or something like that. That's usually I start looking at the sentences and I'm like, oh well they're they're not cramming enough into into what they're you know, the actual sentence structure, if that makes sense. No, it makes perfect sense. Uh it I, I can see how writing short stories, particularly if you do so often enough to get good at it, would teach you to like if you have a very I want I don't want to say economical method of, of using words, but high value, high impact method of writing and I, I I tend when I uh, when I write a story, I'll shoot for say five thousand words, and it will take me two thousand words to describe the first room that people are in. So, yeah, I have to I have to develop my word economy a little bit more. Yeah, that's novel pacing. <laughs> yeah, that's that's how it goes. Yeah, I've gotten two short stories out now, and I, I think they're okay. The people who I gave them to seem to like them, so I'm getting better. But that's it. That's what matters. I, don't, I mean, I've written over a hundred short stories. It's not like I started out knowing. Like, I feel I'm pretty good at them at this point, but it, it took a lot of work. Yeah, practice makes perfect. Nobody likes hearing that though, because practice also takes time. Well, yeah, and it also means that, you know, you you can't be afraid to fail. But the nice thing about short stories is that if you failed, you've only wasted a few thousand words. It's like if you fail in a novel, you might have to throw that whole thing out and start over. Yeah, that's, you know, that's so, very true. Short yeah. stories are very good for experiments. Yeah. Um, all right, well, yeah, that's all I had for this section, so I'm just going gonna, gonna to hand you off now to Jeff. <clears throat> okay, I, I see. Looking at you've got a very impressive catalog, so kudos to that. I was noticing that your stories have encompassed epic fantasy, dark fantasy, urban, and even science fiction. Did you intentionally choose those genres, or was it a write it out, see what you get type of thing? Well, I mean, I grew up reading science fiction and fantasy, a lot of it, um, and I and it's always been shelved in the same shelves. So I just started writing what I'd been reading, I guess. And and personally, I think that science fiction in particular works much better in the short genre than it does in the novel length. It can work in the novel length, but there's just certain kinds of short of, of science fiction that I think is boring novel length, <laughs> personally. Um, because it, you know, a short story, you can take an idea and you can really explore that idea and you don't have to carry anything for more than a few thousand words. But if you take an idea and you try to explore that idea in 90,000 words, you're going to have to add so much more to that to make it an interesting read, for me at least, that you know it's going to be painful. So I think that's one of the reasons why fantasy is, is a much more popular genre among readers than science fiction is because it naturally lends itself with the world building and the plot structures and stuff like that to being a much bigger scope of things than most science fiction concepts. On the average, how what's your average word count for your short stories? Is it right around the forty thousand mark? For for the short stories? Yes. Oh no, um, short stories. My average is probably four to six thousand words. Oh, four to six thousand. Okay. And you're saying sci-fi works better than fantasy when doing the short stories? I mean, fantasy works fine too, but I think that fantasy works better 
long f- like if you if if I had to pick like write a science fiction novel or write a fantasy novel and I was tired and didn't want to do as much work, I would write the fantasy novel because science fiction concepts you have to have a lot in them, I think, or write them more Star Warsy space opera-ish. I just think that there's certain kinds of science fiction, like the more idea-driven science fiction, that it just works much better in the short form for me. So do you prefer to write in the sci-fi genre or the fantasy? I mean, I was wondering what your favorite genre is to write in. Um, I guess fantasy. I like writing science fiction short stories, though. I don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to pick a favorite. But I would, I would say actually probably epic fantasy, just because... You just can make everything up. Totally. I mean, with urban fantasy, you can also make up a lot of things, but you're still kind of couched in the real world, so you have to pay somewhat a mind to that. But with epic fantasy, you know, it's like, as long as you keep your world internally consistent, you can just pretty much say anything. You know, and that, that has to fly if you do it well. With regards to your fantasy stories, what do you think is your main source of inspiration? Is it just your imagination, or do you kind of base it off your real-life experiences? Just wondering how you come up with your subject matter. I mean, it comes from everywhere. It comes from reading. It comes. I I love to crib on mythology a lot um, because I read a lot of mythology. You know, I studied a lot of uh, like the Icelandic sagas, and I don't know. I mean, I think that. Inspiration for a writer comes from all over, right? Like, I'm sure that there's things from the real world that crawl in there and, and things that I've studied and history and, you know, other fantasy novels and, you know, all the all the stuff that you love that kind of sticks in your brain, I think, makes it into the fiction at some point. Did I read in your in your biography that you actually speak medieval Welsh? Um, well, speak is a very loose term. <laughs> I, I know a bit of it. I studied it in college. Same okay, with English so here, Saxon. Here comes the uh, inevitable. You wanna, can you, you want to hear do? some medieval Welsh? Yeah, go for it. Okay, I apologize to anyone who actually knows medieval Welsh because I'm going to butcher this. But let me see if I can do it from memory. Gwedi gwely a gwaidlan, na gwisca serc na merc con, noi thy hin beth kindalan. Yeah, that's, what'd you say? Uh, that's a stanza of the grave. <laughs> Um, let's see if I can get the, what would be the translation exactly? It's like, after battle and bloody horses, or no, after battle and bloody banners and riding white horses, this, even this is the grave of Kindalon, something like that. Very cool. <laughs> that's, I, that was really, that, is that, the, do you think that's the exact pronunciation? Or, I mean, it's close to it? It's pretty close from what I remember. <laughs> Very nice. Well, thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, that's it for my questions for this section. Let me pass I memorized it back over that to 11 years ago, so don't like, quote me on it. But. <laughs> hey, for 11 years old, that's pretty darn good. All right, Lindsay, it's off to you. All right, so we're going to have to figure out how we can tie that into marketing, how uh, knowing a few medieval Welsh words can get you into book club or something. If only it did. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, we'd love to kind of ask you if, uh, kind of what you're doing for marketing and that kind of stuff. Um, I'd, I'd love to ask you about your covers. I think they're really cool, and uh, they, they remind me of the Patri- uh, Patricia Briggs, Mercy Thompson covers. I was curious if that was intentional or if uh, that's just kind of what you were going for with the genre norms. Well, yeah, I mean, it's kind of. Actually, the, the covers that I gave, my cover artist is Raven, who is amazing, and also sadly sick at the moment and not taking new clients so sorry guys um, she basically I gave her I think I gave her the Iron Jared Chronicles covers as the inspiration I was like I want something like this but you know with 20 sided dice on it and you know th- things like that so yeah and and she's amazing and just sort of made exactly what I wanted. Yeah, they're definitely very cool, and I'm sure that helps a lot. Like, we, we always say don't judge a book by its cover, but, boy, if I notice, it's a lot easier to sell books. You know, I've got some that have just <laughs> got okay covers and others that have had really good covers, I think, and it's so much easier to sell the, those ones. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that the covers made a huge difference. Because, <laughs> I mean, I get compliments on them all the time. I think that, you know, they stand out without looking weird. So, I don't know. I, I was... It was a very tough decision at the time because I was utterly broke. And, I mean, I actually, I put the cover co costs on for the first three books. We did them all at once. I put them on a credit card and was, like, praying, basically. <laughs> so, I, I think in, in the end it was a good decision because I was, I'd made a cover. Um, me and a friend of mine, we, we did covers for a while and we're doing our own. And, and, like, they were good and the cover that I made was passable, but it wasn't wow factor and I decided that if I was really going to try to reboot everything in my career with this series I needed wow factor so awesome well I'm, I'm glad it turned out for you and I'm sure you got that credit card paid off there <laughs> yep uh, uh, do you, it worked out would you actually recommend that to somebody who's like starting a new series and might be thinking oh you know what's what's really popular in my genre and kind of maybe Going with a similar style of some like some series that's selling really well. I also love the Iron Druid covers. Yeah, well. I mean, I think that you should like. I mean, I'm not I'm not a big mold breaker at all. I don't I don't believe in breaking the mold. I don't actually like to read books that break the mold too much most of the time. You know, I I want a good story told well with characters that I give a shit about. And so that's the kind of fiction that I write. It's just like straight down the middle you know, genre fiction, I guess. Like, it's it's there to be entertaining. It's not there to, like, blow your mind with unique sentence structure or, you know, the, the cool literary design of the cover or something. So I always study what the bestsellers are doing in whatever genre I'm writing and kind of looking at what the current trends are and stuff like that. And that was one of the big differences with this series, too, is before I hadn't done that because I'd been told, like, oh, don't write to market, don't don't pay attention to readers until the book is done, like, all this stuff. And I totally ditched those ideas, and it worked out much better. So, Yeah, that's kind of the hard, the hard thing to wrap your head around if you're coming from that world of trying to sell stories to magazines and attract an agent's eyes. It seems like they really want something that's different. They've seen some things a thousand times, and they're like, show me something that's different. But then when it actually comes to selling books, like on Amazon, you're like, dang, why are these epic fantasies about orcs and dragons rocking the charts if, if everybody wants different? So it, it definitely helps to write kind of solidly in your genre, for, for sure. And I think that there are certain core things. So, so when I was looking at urban fantasy, and I, I reread some urban fantasy novels I really loved and reversed outlined them, and was looking at what they had in common, trying to kind of boil down the genre to, like, what are the tropes that I need to hit in order to fulfill reader expectation? And, you know, I mean, there's there's cosmetic differences, sure, and some, you, I think you can always add, like, a, a little bit of a, a oh, cool factor, which I hopefully did with the gaming angle. I was like, I'm going to write about nerds. Like, that's going to be the different thing. But I wanted to make sure that I still had the, you know, plucky, snarky protagonist, the cool core of people around her that, you know, she's both being helped by and trying to protect. You know, I wanted the the interesting love interest, you know, the kind of mystery plot angles, you know, a bigger overarching plot of some kind of dire peril. So, like, all of those things are found in pretty much any best-selling urban fantasy. Yeah, speaking of someone who sat down and tried to write urban fantasy and it kind of turned into science fiction with elves, <laughs> I'd imagine it would be a lot easier to sell uh, more classic traditional stuff. But yeah. Hey, the Nine by Night bundles are pretty good, so. Yep, not necessarily because of my book, but <laughs> hey. Well, whatever. We're happy to ride on some coattails. Um, but that actually leads me into my next question is, uh, you know, as we talked about before, we were in that bundle and, uh, you know, I think it sold, I don't know, definitely thousands of copies, if not tens of thousands at uh, 99 cents. Uh, do you think that really was key in helping your series take off or were you doing anything else around that same time? Uh, I didn't do anything, actually, other than that. And I'm not sure. I think it was very helpful in terms of mailing list building. But looking at the number of copies the Justice Calling was selling not in the bundle, because um, actually the, 
Justice Calling has outsold the bundle. So I think that that, I think in some ways, I'm sure the bundle helped with visibility, but I'm not sure it was like the key thing. Because then I would have expected to see a lot more sales of book two and less sales of book one kind of thing. And I didn't even have a book two when the bundle came out. So, but it's like th some something happened with Justice Calling and it just like hit a magic spot in the algorithms. And after, because it, it sold like 50 copies a day for the first couple days and then it was kind of hanging out between 20 and 30 copies a day. And I was like, well, this is way better than anything I've ever done. Like, maybe I can, maybe I can make something out of this. And on like day 11, it suddenly spiked up. And it went up over 100 copies a day by before I'd even released book two. And so I don't know. And, you know, and meanwhile, the Nine by Night bundle was selling like crazy and in the top couple hundred. And so, but with the same book in it. So I don't know what the the workings was or or how the, like how many people came from the bundle to the to the sequel when it finally came out you know, what the sell-through was. I'm not sure, but looking at other bundles that I've been in and the sell-through, the sell-through is not really the reason to be in the bundles, like for the visibility and the mailing list, I think. Yeah, I've definitely had people tell me they found me via bundles, but, you know, it seems like a pretty small percentage compared to, like, if you know, 30, 40,000 copies of the bundle were sold or something. Yeah, and like two people tell you they found you because of the bundle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're like, yay. <laughs> but, um, and I, I think it's useful, and I'm going to keep doing bundles. Actually, Justice Kong is going to be in a new one out soon. Um, but I don't – it's it's hard to tell. Like, why did that book take off? I have no idea. Maybe it was the cover. Maybe it was the 99-cent price. Maybe I just hit some kind of missing thing in the market. You know, it was probably partially the Nerd Legion – because we are legion, and I think that people really appreciated a book about a nerdy character that was written by someone who speaks nerd and not dumbed down for anyone, or you know, because I don't, I don't explain most of the references. I don't, I just kind of roll with it, and I'm like, well, if somebody doesn't get it, then they don't get it, and maybe they'll enjoy the book less, but they're not my audience, so. Yeah, so, yeah I mean, I'm I'm terrible when it comes to marketing. <laughs> I'm, I'm awful at it. There's something to be said, too, for just kind of getting a lot of books out there, and, uh, you know, your luck is that much better of having one that kind of becomes a hit and strikes than if you just have one book. Well, yeah, and I think that also being willing to try different things, because I think that if I had, if I hadn't dropped everything and said, okay, I'm going to try this new series and start out, and I went with the 99-cent price, I think, because... Um, was it Ed Robertson maybe convinced me to do it? Somebody I was talking to was like, oh, yeah, I've been launching a new series with the 99-cent first book. I'm like, even without the second book? like, It's like, well, what do you want? Like, what do you need now? Do you need visibility or do you need money? And I was like, I need both, but I really want visibility because that will lead to money. And so I figured I would make the money on the second book. And so that's why I launched it at 99 cents. I'm like, I know that, you know, even if this book sells well, I'm going to be making 35 cents a copy. It's not going to be the book that saves me from, you know, the medical bills and stuff, but if I can get enough people into the series, you know, the two ninety nine book is gonna sell and that will make me two dollars a copy and then I'll be able to, you know, pay bills. So and it that worked out. Yeah, I've definitely seen some people, you know, really kinda hit it with the ninety nine cents. It's it's such a low barrier to entry that if people are like, Oh hey, cool cover, cool blurb, I'll just buy it. So Definitely work. Yeah, and, and that's what I wanted, is I wanted no... I wanted to get through as much resistance as possible. I wanted people to be like, hey, this looks cool, it might be good. Like, oh, it's less than a buck, let's do it. And I figured if I launched it, you know, two ninety nine or something, plus it's short, and I wrote the first two pretty short because I wanted to write them fast, and I wanted to... Well, and I like writing short. I think I can tell a pretty pretty good amount of story in 30,000 words. But I really wanted to make it so that I could release them quickly, and then if it took off, I could write longer books. And if it didn't take off, I could move on to something else, and I wouldn't have invested you know, 90,000 words or something into it. So, 
Yeah, we here are all like, oh, 90,000 words, that's a short fantasy novel. <laughs> but I uh, know that seems like a really great strategy because it's not like you can sell a novel for a whole lot more if it's 200,000 words versus 50,000 words. So it seems really smart to do that. Yeah, I mean, I, who is it? Is it Mimi who says that anything over 35,000 words is charity? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like her. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I think that, well, in, in book six, it's probably going to come in close to 60,000 words, so they're getting longer. But I really like, I don't know, I don't, I always try to put more description in because my husband, who beta reads my stuff, he's always like, you should describe things more. And so I'll put it in, I'll be like, oh my god, this thing is so slow, it has too much description. He's like, this is almost enough. So I, I tend to go more for the action character plot thing and not so much describing everything. And so my books tend to be pretty lean because I just, I just cram it all in there. I think it's just my natural style, and I've kind of learned not to fight it. Although I'm going to try and write um, some 200,000-word epic fantasies. <laughs> Just to see if I can at some point. But I'll probably try and sell those to a traditional publisher for a lot of money. And then if that doesn't happen, I will probably figure out how to like rework the books into hundred thousand word novels and put them out because you know, I don't I it's not like I can charge, you know, fifteen bucks for a two hundred thousand word novel and five bucks for a hundred thousand word novel kind of thing. It's like, no, you kind of, you know, five, six bucks tops. So why? You know, why, why give to charity, I guess. Oh, it makes perfect sense to me. Um, I'm not big on description, but boy, my characters like to talk, so that's where I get in trouble is uh, lots of dialogue. Um, one more thing I wanted to ask you about before handing you to, to the guys is I've, I've seen you mention on K-Boards that you've tried pre-orders and maybe did them for, like, your third and fourth books or something. But then, Fourth and fifth, yeah. Yeah, but now you're saying no way, I don't want to do pre-orders anymore. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your experience and uh, what, what you're thinking on them as far as now goes? I'm not doing pre-orders anymore. That's my thinking on them. So when I released book three, it pulled up everything. Like it, it shot everything back up into the top 500. It hung out in the top 500 itself. Like I, I, There was this big series boost from releasing it. And then... I did pre-orders on book four because I was like, oh, hey, we've got this pre-order thing. Let's try that. And at first I was really excited because my book was on the hot new release list for months. And yeah, I did a two-month pre-order, I think, right? September, October. No, I did a three-month pre-order? Two and a half months? Something like that. Anyway, it doesn't matter. And, and I had like almost 5,000 pre-orders when the book launched. And I was like, dude, this is so much money dropping in one day. Like, this is amazing, you know, and then I was looking at the actual seller, and I'm like, wow, this is only like 40% of the people who have bought, you know, book uh, book three. So it's not like the sell-through was that great because once once the book is out, my sell-through usually pops up. I think from book three to book four, it's like, I have it written down somewhere. Yeah, book three to book four is about 80% sell-through now, you know, looking at the total numbers over the months. And then book four had a couple of good days, shot up into the top 200, and then it sank like a stone. And books one, two, and three didn't get any rise. They didn't get any lift. And so instead of a, a natural rise over the course of a of few weeks after release, um, everything just sort of kept trailing off, just like I hadn't had a release. Except for, you know, there was an extra, like, 50 to 70 sales a day of book four, which bumped things up a little bit. But if I looked at the graph without the, you know, with, without looking at that, it was like sales continued exactly the same as they had if I hadn't released a book. But just with a few extra sales added on because of the book that was selling again. And I was like, huh, maybe, maybe that was just a December thing, like a December phenomenon. And I'd already set up the pre-order on book five, so I was like, well, we'll just roll with it. And then book five had, what, almost like 8,000 pre-orders or something. And I was like, well, we'll see. Maybe this won't happen again. Oh, it totally happened again. <laughs> like, no rise in the series. Everything fell back down immediately. I don't think book five even hit the top. I think it got to like 400 ranking, maybe. Um, and it fell out of the top 1,000 really quick and pretty much 
stayed where it's been at. I think it's hanging out around like 2,500 to 3,500 ranking in the store. And that's where it's been at since a few days after release. So there was no bounce at all. And it, it just killed all stickiness momentum. And I think part of that is because when you set a pre-order, you get your also bots with the pre-order. So they populate during that time with whatever books they're going to populate with then. Whereas when you have a release without a pre-order, you get the books that are releasing that week, that are hot that week, you know, if you have a good release. And so I think that when your also bots populate and you populate into other people's also bots, you're way more visible immediately after release. And I'm, I'm just, I could be making that up, but that's what seemed to happen. And so with book six, which is coming out at the end of this month, I'm releasing it without a pre-order and hopefully it will perform like books two and three did instead of books four and five. So we'll see, I guess. But I'm, I'm not, I want, I would rather be sticky than have the guaranteed sales. All right. Yeah, I've kind of heard that a lot on with Amazon, and I'm actually doing my first pre-order there now. <laughs> so, but Sorry. it's a book five in a series, and I wasn't expecting like anybody's going to jump in and buy book five anyway, as an already committed to the series. But um, I'm curious, did you find it different? And you're in all the other stores, right? You're not doing KDP Select, is that right? Yeah, I did. I didn't go in Select. I just did. Uh, I, did I went wide with it. Well, because, I mean, the, the bundle was wide, and so I didn't have the choice anyway. But I actually really – well, in some ways, I'm glad I made that decision. One time I sat down and actually did the math on – so if I, had a, if I had a borrow ratio of, like, three sales to one borrow, which is actually – most people I know either get one-to-one -one or two-to-one. But I did the math with a three-to-one ratio. I lost, like, $20,000 by not being in, in KDP Select. But – I don't know. Right now I have, especially after putting the first book free and getting a book bub, like I've, I've got, my sales have been generally climbing on all the other sites slowly to the point where if like Amazon disappeared in a cloud of smoke tomorrow, the money I'm making on the other sites provided it didn't die also would pay my rent. And so I feel more stable as a writer because I have that instead of being all in. And so I'm, I'm giving up like you know, money for sort of a tenuous feeling of security, I guess. I don't know. All right. And did you find that the pre-orders, did you do them on the other sites? And was it any different? Because, you know, I've heard that there it actually helps you on release day. I did I did a short pre-order on, because um, they want you to have the final file. Uh, I did a short pre-order on... Barnes and Noble and Apple, um, and then Apple it got screwed up, and actually the book didn't go live live until later, which screwed me out of a U.S. A to Day bestseller ranking, which sucks. But that's like the third time that I've been super close. But I didn't have a ton of pre-orders. Um, I think I had like 150 pre-orders through Barnes and Noble and, and maybe 80 through Apple. So, you know, compared to Amazon, it wasn't much anyway. All right, well, I'm going to see for myself here because, yeah, I'm the same way. I've got, like, some thousands on Amazon and, like, I don't know, it's hard to tell because I'm going through Smashwords, so it's I'm not sure how accurate it is. But so far, the numbers on Barnes & Noble and on iTunes are kind of looking unimpressive, but uh, we shall see. It's, it's an experiment. <laughs> why, why not draft to digital? They're so nice. Oh, I know. I actually I chatted with them on another podcast, and it's just that I they weren't around when I started. You know, so I'm too lazy to... I yeah, I've been slowly transitioning, and all of my new stuff is going up, because Smashwords just keeps... Like, I'll, I'll update something in a description, and then it will tell me the file is wrong, and I'm like, this is the file that has been for sale on this site for three years. What's wrong with it? And so I've, I've pretty much given up on them. I'm like, I don't want to go through 50 emails while you figure out that nothing is wrong. <laughs> Thanks. I don't have time for that. Yeah, I'm just going direct anywhere I can now, but uh, with the pre-orders, I think I couldn't on Barnes & Noble, so that's why. Yeah, I don't I think do them direct on Barnes & Noble. All right, but um, thanks for answering my questions. I'm going to hand you over to Joe now. He's got a few for you, too. Yep. Um, okay, so first, uh, looking at your book list, on uh, you were speaking about Kindle Select versus going wide. I noticed that a lot of your stuff is widely available, but you still got some stuff on Kindle Select. What's sort of your strategy with Kindle Select, and how's it working for you? So the series that I have up in Select, I have the first book wide. Um, it's a novella series, an epic fantasy novella series. How's that for an oxymoron? Um, 
And the, so the first book is perma-free, and it's everywhere. And they're all written so that they can be read in any order and are kind of standalone. Um, although everybody seems to read them in order anyway. But And then I decided that since I was making zilch with them on the other sites, that I would test... So once once KU came out last year, I was like, let's let's go in with the other three novellas and see what we do. And uh, I don't get a ton of borrows, actually. I think last month was like 125 borrows, so it's it's not a lot, but it still works out to more money than they were making on the other sites. So I think it's kind of like. I, I don't mind those being in. And so I'm going to release a fifth novella this year in that series, and then I'm going to write a trilogy of novels um, sort of related to that. I mean, with the same characters and everything, but they're going to be, you know, it's going to be a novel trilogy, so it'll be different. And that I'm going to put wide, I think. So the, the novella will go into select. And so if people want to read the novellas other than the first one, they'll have to go through Amazon. But for the novels... I'm just not sure that it makes sense for me at this point to, you know, have a four ninety nine book that you can borrow and I'm gonna get paid a buck forty on kind of thing. Like it just doesn't I don't know. I I would just rather have the, the option of, of having the other sites and you know, and as I said, my income on the other sites has been growing, my sales have been growing. You know, even even Kobo has getting getting some sales for me these days, so you know, Google Play and stuff. So I feel like there's just a lot more options when I'm not in select because then I can run different promos. I can put something perma-free if I want to. So, yeah. So I don't think KU is bad. And I think if I was writing purely serials or all novella-length stuff, I might just go all in with it. But for for where I'm at now... Like I, I don't think I would put longer work into it, just because I, I want my stuff widely available and to have that security of having it widely available, and I want the opportunity to perma free things if I want to and stuff like that. And you just lose a lot of that with Amazon when you're direct. Yep, uh, that's been my uh, observation as well. I, I, I'm. You and I are of one mind on the, on the subject of being wide, if for no other reason than to have a safety net if something goes wrong in any one of the other distribution places. And uh, although I tend to underprice my books, so probably the the profit end of of losing sales in favor of borrows wouldn't affect me quite so much. I still well, would prefer. I mean, I probably would make more money if I was all in with Amazon. It's it that is that is a reality that I have just decided to deal. with. So, you know, I think it's a it's a trade off of like what what do you feel is best for you? And I I like being wide, and I like having that freedom. Likewise, and I also know that a tremendous number of my most vocal fans are not reading on Amazon. They're they're uh, Nook readers or, uh, or iBooks. So, I would hate to sort of leave them out in the cold. Well, they can get an app, I guess. But uh, yeah. It is it is nice to have multiple formats available. Uh, all right. So my next question is in your uh, in your Amazon author profile, you mentioned being Hugo Award nominated. And from my research, <laughs> it looks like uh, you were involved in the recent Hugo unpleasantness. Uh, do you have any yeah. thoughts on that? Um, I'd rather not talk about it. I suspected I that no would be the longer. case. I mean, I I, have, I will always be Hugo Award nominated because I withdrew. It's not like I declined my nomination technically. Mm -hmm. So George George R. R. Martin said I can have a Hugo Losers ribbon at Worldcon. So good enough <laughs> for me. But yeah, I'd I'd just rather put that whole mess behind me. Sorry. All right. So you know, slipping to we'll sidestep it and say a lot of people seek accolades and bestseller lists and and awards. Do you think that awards have any legitimate marketing advantage, or is it just a line in your resume and something to make you feel better? I think it probably helped me get a book bub because they rejected me like 27 times and then after I was nominated they took me. So Well done. But it, it, who knows, you know. So I think in some ways that kind of thing can help. But, I mean, honestly the best way to have more success is to be successful that I found, which is a sucky 
like evil loop that you can get stuck in because it's like, well, if I had success, I could get more success. But it's the kind of thing where it's like you you want agents to give you phone calls, sell a lot of books. Yeah. You know, you want good publishing deals, sell a lot of books. You want Amazon Algo Love, sell a lot of books. You want lots of reviews, well, sell a lot of books. And so it's this like like well, how do I do that without these things? You know, and so you you end up with like trying to create chickens from you know, eggs and eggs out of chickens and like, well, I need, I need, I need a chicken or an egg to start with, or I'm not going to have either. And so, I, I think that sometimes things like awards can help with that. In terms of maybe they'll give you that little boost or something, but I think it's also probably pretty hit and miss. Yeah, um, I've sort of felt, and maybe it's just because I don't have any awards, but I've sort of felt that an award is a little bit like a diploma where, yeah, you earned it, and congratulations that you did, but it's what you picked up along the way that gets you to the next step and not so much the piece of paper or the, or the words written on a certificate. Yeah, I mean, I think that for, for at least, like, big awards and stuff, they're, they're a, you know, they're, they're a symptom of your success already, you know, because you're not going to get nominated unless you're being read kind of thing. So I, I think it's a, you know, the, the kind of thing that generally don't happen to someone out of the blue this without that person already seeing some kind of level of success. You know, it's not like you're going to put up your book on Amazon, sell 15 copies, and then get nominated for a Hugo and take off and be a huge hit. Yep. You know, you, you're, you're probably not going to be noticed, <laughs> as harsh as that sounds. <laughs> At the very least, you need to be widely read before somebody with enough influence nominates you. And at that point, if you're widely read, then you, you've you got the success that you were looking for, hopefully. And it yeah. is unfortunate. It's unfortunate, as you were saying, that uh, it seems like the, the, the mechanisms out there that help you sell more books only start helping you when you stop needing the help. Like, once you've got your footing, then you can run. But until you get your footing, you're just stuck. I don't think you ever stop needing the help. <laughs> well, but but yeah, I mean it is there is a Oh, who was it? Somebody did a really great post on Keyboards once. I think it was Courtney Milan where she was talking about the stages of of being an indie writer and like how if you're in stage 1, you don't like nobody knows who you are. You might you'll release a book, you'll sell five copies, probably to people you know, that kind of thing. And then stage two, maybe you have some people on your mailing list. You 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 can release a book and you're gonna sell like 50 to 100 copies the first month, like to people that you don't know. You know, you're starting to gain a little traction. And then stage three is like where you know you've got hundreds of people on your mailing list. You put out a book, you know it's gonna sell a few hundred copies. And then stage four is like you know, getting more towards like Courtney Milan and Hugh Howie and stuff like that. But the the hardest stage to get out of is stage one. And I think a lot of getting out of stage one is I mean you can be strategic and you can do you know the the things that consistently work for people, which doesn't mean it's gonna work for you the first time you try it, of course. But I think that a lot of what the beginning struggle is 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 getting out of that stage one is like how do I get read? You know, how do how do people even know who I am? And so I think that that's where a lot of, you know, and so worrying about awards and accolades and stuff like that, I think is counterproductive because that is not a stage one writer problem. If you, if you think that you have, you know, if you legitimately think that you are likely to be nominated for an award or you get nominated for an award, you are probably not a stage one writer anymore. So... I don't know if that makes sense, but... No, yeah, again, it makes perfect sense. You, you don't worry about what color you're going to paint your house until after you buy your house. Right, if you don't own a house, like, why buy the paint? Yep. Yeah. Um, all right, well, that's the end of my list, so I'm going to pass you on to Jeff. All righty, uh, Annie, you mentioned that you haven't, you aren't exactly the best at advertising. I'm just kind of wondering, uh, you, you've obviously tried doing some advertising. Which one has had your best return of investment, do you think? BookBub? Book, BookBub. I finally saw what all the fuss was about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've been hearing a lot of good things about them. I've tried a couple times, and they've naturally given me like, nah, not this time, thank you. It's like, but I'll keep trying there. So, um, 
are there any types of marketing or publicity you feel isn't being used enough by indie authors? Well, I mean, I, I th there's always the advice like write the next book. I think that some people, the people that make me saddest that I watch the careers of, because um, I, I stalk quite a few people and have for many years now, is the people, is either the people who write a book that really takes off and does very well and they don't follow it up, like, because I've seen that happen. I've seen people hit the New York Times list and then they don't write another book or they write a book that is totally sideways and has nothing to do with the first book and is in a totally different genre or different length or, you know, it's it's just something that, like, they are not going to capture any of the audience that they already got. And, like, those people make me so sad because it's like you hit gold and you're like, well, the gold's over there. I'm going to go try this mountain. It's like, what? Why? What? Yeah, I, <laughs> I've done that a few times. And also the people who have, like, they'll write, like, eight or ten books in a series, which is great, except for that series doesn't sell. And so instead of trying to either revamp everything to get it to sell, like maybe they have it marketed to the wrong genre, maybe their covers suck or aren't genre appropriate, you know, maybe they don't have a funnel going. It's like those people also make me really sad because I think you can get stuck too hard in just doing one thing over and over again and hoping it'll work differently. And that's a real danger when you have total control. And so I think that while well, writing the next book is really great advice, I think another thing that probably writers could do more and probably I should do more of this is not be afraid. Like, one, follow up the good things, like the things that are working. Even if you're like, you know, and, and all of this advice obviously is for people who really care about the money business side of things because I'm a total mercenary. So that's what I speak to. Like, you know, the, the writing and craft – is your art, but if you're going to publish, you you have to acknowledge that you're entering a business, and that you're going to get creamed if you don't treat it like a business. You know, it's not like you can you can be all lovey about your beautiful sentences or whatever, but you know, if if your books aren't selling, you can't look at them as your babies. You have to look at them as, you know, it's they're. You no, know, that analogy is terrible. But, I mean, basically, I see it as, like, I'm a pimp, right? And my books are, you know, they're my bitches. And, like, I put them out there, and if they don't have the right lipstick or whatever and aren't earning me money, then I have to, like, you know, I have to clean those bitches up or take them off the street and put out new bitches. Like, I'm going to get so much hate mail. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think that, that analogy, though, there's a lot of people that can relate to it because it paints a perfect picture of exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> so. Well, like you can, I don't think you can be precious about it. And so I think that the thing that I see the most among indies who are failing to break out, I think, is that they get precious. And they might be they might even acknowledge it that you know they'll be like, "Oh yeah, I know my covers aren't exactly like this or or I'm not doing this or you know, but but people will love it anyway for what it is." And it's like, "No, your baby is ugly and nobody loves it but you." Like <laughs> You know, we don't like to say that, but, you know, and so, I don't know. I'm, I'm getting mixed up with prostitutes and babies now, so it's getting weird. <laughs> Playing the medication. Okay. okay. Social media, are you for or against? I am for it, I think, except for I think it should be used. I don't use it to sell books. Like, I'm, I'm terrible about updating my author Facebook page, for example. Um, I use Twitter to just have funny conversations with friends and post cat pictures. But, like, people who use social media to try and, and sell, 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 it's the same thing with people trying to, like, network at conventions. You know, if you can tell if somebody is desperate and trying to just get you to listen to them talk about their stuff. And nobody wants to be around that person. And I think that social media should be used the same way. Like, be excited, connect with fans, you know, talk about the things you're excited about, and, you know, just be you and don't worry so much about, you know, oh, well, I've got 400 people who like my Facebook page, but when I put out a book, it only sells five copies. Why aren't those people engaging? I must, you know, post 15 more times on my Facebook. It's like, I don't really care. So. Yep, I hear you. And I think if you hate social media, you shouldn't do it because that's going to come across too. Like if you're treating it like a chore, 
I think people will notice, and you're going to notice, and you're going to be miserable, and, like, who has time for that? Uh, merchandise or swag, I mean, do you have, do you actually, like, have any of your stuff, like, on, like, use, like, Cafe Press or Zazzle or anything like that? No, it's on my list of, <laughs> of things that I want to do. I actually want to... There, there's a couple companies I'm thinking of contacting to see if I can get um, special 20-sided dice made just for this series to, to, to give away or, I don't know, have available for people. Um, and, and when I do, like, signings and stuff, I give away a D20 with every book. <laughs> oh. Very cool. Do you have fans actually make you stuff and, and like, send you anything? No. My my fans are like the faceless masses. They they send me emails sometimes telling me how I'm wrong about things. <laughs> okay. Like how and, unicorns unicorns are horses, so they have hair, not fur. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Next time you pet a unicorn, send me a picture. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I I need you to do me a favor. I need you to ask Lindsay what that thing is on her top shelf over on the right corner of her screen. Like the the red dildo looking thing. <laughs> That would be the thing, yes. She, she went there. <laughs> we had a romance author on, and she didn't even go there until we stopped recording. <laughs> hey, I've already talked about my books as, like, prostitutes, so, you know, we're, we're there. We're 100% down this road. <laughs> For your information, okay. it's a Kraken, and it was knitted by a fan. Thank you. It might be crochet. I can never remember the difference. <laughs> well, Squid was going to be my second guess, but Dildo was funnier. <laughs> It would be a really substantial dildo. <laughs> you clearly do not watch enough porn. <laughs> that thing's about average. like a foot and a half tall. <laughs> well, I'm definitely done with my questions. Lindsay, back to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On that note, I'm going to kind of close things up here. I, I would just say that um, I have some really cool steampunk dice that I can't read when I roll them. So if you actually get cool dice made, make sure that you don't have to have like 15, 15 vision in order to actually read the numbers on them. <laughs> yeah, they would they would probably be pretty standard. Although I might get them made in metal, in which case they're not really for rolling; they're more for having. Because I, I have some metal dice that are really cool, but you do not uh, want to roll those things. Yeah, on for the throwing table. at people that piss you off, maybe. Yeah, like the the GM be nice dice. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, kind of in closing, do you have any parting advice for authors or thoughts on what the next big thing will be for marketing? Oh, for marketing? I, don't, I have no idea. I wish I knew. Because <laughs> um, there's, there's just so many different things you can try, and I don't know what, you know, and some things work for some people, and they're really good at it. And so I think that, that what is going to stay constant is just writing good books and making sure that you're – all of the stuff under your control, like the covers and the editing and the formatting and all of that, is as you know a, a top of product as you can make it. Because I think those are the kind of books that are going to last in terms of you know. I mean, yeah, we all know like the books that have the terrible covers and typos that make you want to stab your screen that sell like gangbusters. But often, if you go back and look at those books a year later, nobody's reading them. And I think it's the ones that really, you know, if, I think if you focus on making a quality product first and foremost and getting it positioned right in terms of how it looks and everything like that, that that those are the books that are going to have the best chance of still being read in five years or, you know, st uh, that, that will sell consistently. And so I think that's the most important thing is just to, and, and I realize like in some ways that's more of like a craft thing than a marketing thing, but I think that a, a really good book is your best marketing. Because people are going to read it and they're going to talk about it and they're going to be like, oh my god, that book that I read, that was so kick-ass, it did this, this, and this, like you got to read this. And that's what you really want is people going to other people and saying, you got to read this. Because that's how you build you know, an actual fan base, I think. So I don't think that's going to change. Yeah, definitely good advice. And and if you keep plugging along and doing the thing and you publish 10 books, when you finally do get that little chance, you know, and manage to stick in the Amazon algorithms, then you've got nine more full price books that people can go on to buy. So <laughs> Well, and they will cross because, like, my I mean, 20 side had pulled up my whole catalog. None of the other books sell as well as that series does, but it, it, it yanked everything up, you know, and so I, I think I see, like, an 8% crossover, which is small, 
But when you think about it in terms of like one series selling tens of thousands of copies, that 8% actually becomes a significant number. So, you know, I, I think it's it's worth it. Unless you have a book you're really ashamed of or something and like that nobody should read. You know, then maybe you pull it. Like I've pulled some short stories and stuff because I didn't want my Amazon page to look like a big clutter of short stories. I actually have less products out now than I used to. Like at the beginning of 2014, I had like 40 books up in terms of like short stories collections and stuff like that. And I pulled a bunch of them and I made some other ones free. But I think it's a, you know, as long as the stuff you're writing is close enough to the thing that takes off, I think it, it is going to lift everything in my experience. And so it's totally worth, it's not like that, that effort before is wasted effort just because you wrote a book that didn't sell as well as the book that's selling now. Yeah, yeah true. definitely true. And I've experienced the same thing. So, uh, Hopefully people will be encouraged that just because your first series isn't like a huge hit, that doesn't mean it can't sell a lot later. <laughs> but um, yeah, for closing out, why don't you tell us kind of like where people can find you and uh, maybe which book you want them to start on if they want to check it out. Well, they can start on Justice Calling. Unless they really like um, epic fantasy, in which case they should probably read the uh, Griffin Bite Chronicles. Although, you can pretty much hear the dice falling on the table in those novellas, <laughs> just to warn you. They're, they are unabashedly, like, D&D fanfic, pretty much. Like, they're my version of, you know, it's basically a homebrewed game written as a story. So, um, and my website is anniebelay.com. It's pretty easy to find me. All right, great. And we'll put links on the website at uh, marketing sff. <laughs> Dot com, which I can never pronounce or remember the right number of Fs. And uh, so if anybody wants to check you out from there, we'll uh, have all your links up. And uh, thanks a lot for coming on the show today, Annie. Cool. Thanks for having me. Thanks for all the info. Hopefully it was helpful. It was great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right.